Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, welcome back. It's great to be here again. It's always a pleasure to be with you and the viewers and listeners. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we left off on our series here on the history of economic thought. Uh, if I may, I'd like to just give a little recap. In, in part one of the series, we began with Adam Smith and some of the economists that had, had, uh, had come before Adam Smith. And then we worked our way up through the classical economists, John Stuart Mill, David Ricardo. We had talked about the labor theory of value that culminates with Karl Marx, where he's talking about how employers are stealing what rightfully belongs to the employees because of the labor theory of value. And then we came up in part two to the marginal revolution in 1870 that involved uh, three people who simultaneously but independently came up with the marginal theory, uh, the marginal utility theory of value or subjective theory of value that totally destroyed the labor theory of value of, on which Marx and Marx and economics was based. And those three were Valra, Jevons, and Menger. And we, so we talked a little bit about the Austrian school, uh, beginning with Karl Menger and his principles of economics. And we worked our way up to the two of the successors that came immediately after Menger in the Austrian school, uh, Wieser and Bombavirk. And uh, we were starting to get into Ludwig von Mises, who came after them. So I think what we ought to do is develop uh, a little bit more of the Austrian school uh, in, in the course of today's half hour, but also develop what came out of the other two schools, the, the ones that were originating with, with Jevons and Valra, uh, and then com maybe compare the two and then talk about a little bit, uh, maybe in the next segment, a little bit about uh, the aftermath of, of that. So why don't I turn it over to you and... Take it away. Okay. Well, as, as we had talked about in the last segment on this, uh, in, 18, in the 1870s, there had occurred this near simultaneous dis discovery of the concept of marginal utility, marginal decision making, in contrast to the classical economist's labor theory of value. And as you pointed out, uh, this began in 1871 with books by the British economist William Stanley Jevons, the Austrian economist Karl Menger, and then in 1874 uh, with the French economist Leon Valra. Uh, now, most histories of economic ideas uh, will argue the following, or something like the following, that these three individuals had come and discovered this idea near simultaneously, but independent of each other, and originally not knowing about each other's existence. Uh, but they each had presented it in a slightly different way. But while their mode of formulation may have varied, the core concept was the same. Now, uh, at the beginning, as I think I mentioned in, in the earlier segment, uh, while Jevons never knew about Menger, Jevons died tragically in a swimming accident uh, off the coast of Britain, uh, Menger and Valra did come to know each other. Uh, they discovered each other's books. They actually corresponded, and their letters exist. Uh, and they began to have an argument about how to do economics, the method of doing economics. And as later became a major difference between the Austrian school and the mainstream of micro or marginalist economics, uh, Menger challenged uh, Leon Valra's formulation of the new microeconomics uh, in a mathematical formulation. He argued that while mathematics can be a tool of logic, an auxiliary a way of thinking, that the core of it was not mathematical, but understanding the intentionality and purposefulness behind the choices and decisions of the actors. And, and this could not be captured in a narrow skeletal conception of reducing human activity to, uh, to a mathematical formulation. But be that as it may, uh, it, it's, it's true to say that while they had these differences and sometimes they rose to the surface as in these letters between Menger and Balra, it is also the case that at least up until the First World War, 1914, uh, most of these economists view that, viewed themselves as all sharing a common viewpoint and analytical framework, and that these were merely nuanced differences among themselves. Uh, indeed, um, 
around the turn of the century, around 1901, an American uh, sociologist named Albion Small was in Vienna and had a conversation with Menger in which Menger said that the economics profession had basically now taken on and absorbed and were utilizing virtually all of his economic theoretical concepts. And therefore, since it had been universalized, more or less, within the economics profession, uh, he didn't care whether the, whether, whether, the whether the title or labeling the Austrian school uh, continued to exist or not. This shows itself that, that the founders uh, viewed themselves more or less as all saying the same things in slightly different language. But in fact, now in retrospect, as it became clear as the 20th century progressed, there became two, two breaks, two branches of this marginalist theme. Uh, one became what we call the mainstream of textbook, economic textbook, microeconomics, and the Austrian tradition. And before I talk about some of the highlights of the Austrian approach, um, as particularly captured as the 1920s and the 30s and the 40s progressed, uh, in particularly uh, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, though of course others, uh, let me sort of explain, well, what about this mathematical or, or approach that, that followed from, from the Jevons and Valra tradition? Uh, it began to be formalized in its own way, uh, beginning in the 1920s in particular. Uh, and it got encapsulated, though not exclusively, uh, in what became known as the perfect competition model. Uh, this was first sort of rigorously presented in terms of its, presum its assumptions and conditions by uh, an economist named Frank Knight, uh, who wrote a book in 1921, or published in 1921, called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. And while he himself uses no mathematics in the book, he basically explains the logical uh, conditions for a state of perfect economic equilibrium. That is, in all markets, simultaneously, uh, supplies and demand are in balance, uh, revenues equal costs, uh, resources are being used in the most efficient and optimal way among the alternative lines of production for which they could be employed. Uh, and this model, the perfect competition model, particularly as became uh, increasingly presented in a, uh, the, the clothe and the rigor of, of mathematical formulation, became the, the model for, for economic thinking in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and in fact, until today. But it is the particular way this model was put together that made the Austrians, as I'll try to explain shortly, particularly Mises and Hayek, to realize that, that the Austrian tradition of marginalism and, dis, and individual decision making had certain essential and inescapable difference of assumption and logic from this other mainstream approach from Jevons and Balra. Now, what are the conditions for this state of perfect competition? Every student who has taken a Principles of Economics course uh, probably would recall some of, or all of these. Uh, that, in fact, as I said, Frank Knight, who later became a famous economist at the University of Chicago, um, formulates. First, that everyone in the market is a price taker. That is, each buyer and seller is so small relative to the overall market in which they respectively are doing their buying and selling that their choice or decision to buy a little bit more, buy a little bit less, produce and sell a little bit more, produce and sell a little bit less, has no appreciable effect on the market price. So no one changes the price. The market is found in the market and people merely in terms of the quantities they respectively want to buy or sell uh, adjust and adapt to the market price. Uh, that, 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 that means there's no decision maker, actor, determining what the price should be or moving the price if some error on supply and demand is found to be the case. The second assumption of the model is that each and every seller sells a product that is a perfect and absolute substitute for the product that, they are, that their rivalrous competitor is selling in that same specific market. So if we're talking about the market for blue jeans, every seller is selling from the buyer's point of view a pair of blue jeans exactly like his competitors. A pair of blue jeans is a pair of blue jeans is a pair of blue jeans. It doesn't matter the design on the back pocket or how the, the belt loops are, 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 are attached. A pair of blue jeans is a pair of blue jeans. So no seller can try to persuade any consumer that their version of the product is different and therefore superior to their competitors to attract consumer business away from their rival. Now, what is this meant to do? To assure that there's only one price in the market. Oh, mine is better than his, and since it's better in quality, 
you should be a little bit more. This assures that since every, every pair of blue jeans is like any other pair of blue jeans, no one is going to pay a price for a pair higher than some one is offering it for a lower price. So the market would have one single price in each market. So no product differentiation and no price differential because people are trying to make their versions different than their rivals. The third assumption is what's called uh, no barriers to entry. On the one hand, this means that you know, there are no legal barriers to entry. The government doesn't set up a monopoly wall so some new competitor can't come in and try to compete against an established producer. But it also means that there's no technological barriers to entry. What does that mean? It means that the assumption is, is that capital, for example, is like clay dough, right? I've been making shoes with shoemaking machines. The demand for shoes falls and the demand for electron microscopes rise. Now, the kind of specific machines going into shoemaking is highly unlikely to be the specific kind of machines that helps you make an electron microscope. But no problem. It's all clay dough. I take the machine that makes shoes, go like this, and voila, I've made a new shoe that makes uh, electron microscopes. Now, the, the idea behind this is adjustment to changing market circumstances requires no time. Everything instantaneously adjust to the new market circumstances. There's never a supply out of balance with the demand. There's no a revenue greater than a price or less than a price. Uh, as a result of this, uh, there is always a perfect balancing and relationship between inputs and output and cost and prices because any adjustment time is virtually like that. And the fourth assumption of the perfect competition model is the idea that each and every participant in the market has perfect or sufficient knowledge never to make a pricing error either on the buying side or the selling side. Well, what does that mean? Uh, as I explained to my students, imagine you're walking down the street and uh, you're thirsty on a hot summer day and you come to a store that says Coca-Cola sold per can for $1.50. You go in, you buy the can because you, you, you want to quench your thirst. You're walking down the street and about a block or two down as you're dr still drinking the can of Coke, you discover another store that says can of Coke for $1.25. You go like this, if I had only known I'm, I'm thirsty, but I'm not dying of thirst, I could have waited five minutes and saved a quarter on the can of Coke. Or the seller, I could have sold this at a higher price than I did to someone else if I only knew some other buyer would be coming in later in the day, for instance. With the perfect, perfect knowledge assumption, that type of error can never occur. Everyone knows all the demand conditions, all the supply conditions. No buyer ever pays more than they have to. No seller ever accepts a price lower than they have to. And the markets are in perfect, coordinated equilibrium. Now, if this is your model, you, what, you're, what you're saying is the market is, by definition, in continuous and perfect inter-market equilibrium. Across all markets, all markets are in perfect equilibrium. Now, this model and its rigorous development in a mathematical formulation became the benchmark, the, the analytical basis from which all other economic questions uh, became to be analyzed. Uh, this became particularly important as the 20th century progressed in terms of economic policy issues. For example, uh, if all markets are supposed to be in this perfectly balanced, efficient uh, state at all times across all sectors of the economy, then what if you discover that some market is not? A seller is selling a differentiated product. That is one that consumers think is different than his rivals in that market. Or what if a seller is selling a product for something above the price that, his, that the rivals in the same market are selling it for? Well, if, this is, if that perfect competition model is your benchmark, then from that perspective, this is a market failure. Supply is not in balance with demand. A, a, a cost is out of balance with the price and therefore costs equaling revenue. Uh, resources are not perfectly allocated at every moment. This is a market failure. And using that sort of rarefied, hypothetical, perfect world, any divergence from it observed in the real world becomes a basis, therefore, to argue that the government must regulate the real world to make the real world confirm to a model that, in fact, the world can never match because we don't have perfect knowledge. In the real world, things take time to adjust and adapt. Uh, the, the purpose of markets or, and competition is to induce people to be competitive and rivalrous to try to make a better mousetrap. And guess what? In the real world, uh, we aren't all just little drop-in-the-bucket price takers that have no influence over price. So, in fact, a, a rarefied hypothetical model of a perfectly adjusted market in this rigorous mathematical form becomes the benchmark not only for, for economic analysis, 
but if in many instances as the 20th century progressed as a, as a benchmark to judge the real world to justify rationalize and then use as a as a guide for trying to regulate prices and production and resource uses and other things uh, in the market through the heavy hand of government now <clears throat> That, that, that became basically the, the, the model of microeconomics. Now, it, of course, it would be unfair to say that, well, mainstream economics, they do still accept or always work with such a, an, an abstract and, and, to be honest, a sort of hypothetically unrealistic model. Of course not. Economists are, un, are not that, you know, misguided. They've tried to refine. They've tried to adopt. They've tried to adjust. But, but the fact is, at a core, that model has always remained as an implicit benchmark or, or logical point of, 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 of analysis from which to look at things, uh, even to today in microeconomics. Now, that then brought about a certain reaction by the Austrians. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me interrupt yeah. you there for a second. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that this is what's going on with antitrust laws, uh, laws that, that uh, libertarians have long opposed yes. that they they look at the situation where uh, that exists among businesses and they say well we're striving for competition here so we have to break up these businesses in order to reach this model this ideal of lots of firms competing in the production of any particular good or service is that what's going on there yes well uh, actually the antitrust example is a perfect example of, of, of how economists judge uh, what's called market concentration. Basically, how many firms are there in a market and what are their respective market shares? Uh, from a critical perspective, is, is, this, is this a truly competitive situation using the perfect competition model as a benchmark? So often in, over the last hundred years, uh, economists and economists working in government, such as the antitrust division of the Justice Department, uh, have, have used this as a basis for uh, saying, well, that this that this firm is acting monopolistically. Uh, these these companies uh, may have degrees of competition, but they're too concentrated, and they're not really uh, operating on the benchmark of a perfect competition model. Therefore, we have to break up a concentrated industry. Uh, we have to uh, disallow a merger because that would make one new big company have too much of a market share and control over the price is right in perfect competition everyone is too small to influence the price so this becomes the basis for the heavy hand of, of the government dictating what the market organization structure relationships and patterns will be uh, guided by that model you are absolutely right and and don't they in the process of doing that they end up destroying what libertarians call economic liberty that is that we would defend the right of people to join up uh, their individual firms. Uh, they may find it in terms of economy as a scale that it's advantageous to combine. But we would argue that if it's your firm, it's your private property, you have a right to sell it or to merge with anyone else under just principles of private property and uh, limited government and, and, and the free market. But what they do is they use this ideal model of, oh, no, you got to have lots of firms out there. And in the process, they destroy the very liberty so, of, a, of a society. And, of course, the government becomes ever stronger. And, 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 it, and it's using this ideal model of lots of firms competing and so forth as the excuse to, to destroy economic liberty. Uh, well, uh, I'm being uh, allowing myself to be a little sarcastic here. Oh, Hortenberger, you just don't, don't understand that this liberty thing is just one of the variables in, 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 uh, of, a, of, a, of a set of influences and factors that, that should determine the trade-offs and the policies of the government. You see, we have to give up a little bit of freedom, Hornberger so that we can have efficient markets that, as we're defining it, better serve the consumers as we're defining an optimal and efficient market. You, you, you just want to go to an extreme, Hornberger. You know, a little bit of freedom may have to be sacrificed for us to manage the economy so it operates better than it is based upon what we define the better as. Yeah, that's exactly what they say. Uh, <coughs> and, and they even talk like that, too. Uh, okay, another, another point, another question here. Sure. Uh, okay. When I went to college, I was an economics major. 
And was that in the 19th century? <laughs> That's man, you're really good and good, Richard. Maybe you ought to go on stage or something. You know, uh, I think there's one leaving tomorrow. <laughs> good one, huh? Uh, okay, I'm in college. I'm an economics major, and I remember taking principles of economics. I think the the, the textbook was by McConnell, mm -hmm. but uh, same sort of thing with Sam Mithlin's textbook, which was the big one at, at, at back in the 70s. Right. And I remember doing all this model building, you know, with charts and graphs, marginal utility curves, cost curves, supply and demand, and so forth. And, and I was thinking that, you know, when I go out into the real world, I'm going to be using these charts and graphs. You know, you see people walking into a store and buying things, and uh -huh. I'll pull out my little pad and to chart the supply mm -hmm. and demand. And it was all nonsense, as I realized when I got out in the real world that, we're dealing with this human beings that are engaged in economic activity and there's no charting or graphing going on in the real world. And but but I remember that this model building, as we used to call it, was essential to the economics, to the study of economics back in the 70s. And I know you're going to get into now this transition to the Austrian school, but we didn't talk in terms like the Austrians did in college. It was all just this this model building. Now, is that still the mainstream economics that, that's being taught in colleges and universities across America? Yes. Uh, at the undergraduate level, let's say at a principles of microeconomics class, uh, the, the degree of just uh, general ma mathematical formulation, that is equations, is minimized uh, due to the fact that many uh, beginning undergraduate students may not have much of a math background. But what the textbooks are loaded with are the ge geometry representations of those mathematical relationships. As you say, the supply curves, the demand curves, the revenue curves, the cost curves. Uh, of course, when the student goes into, if he pursues in economics, as he gets to the intermediate microeconomic level, and certainly if he continues on to graduate school with the graduate microeconomic courses, it, it increasingly becomes more and more complex and uh, sort of uh, 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 a frontier level hyper mathematical analysis uh, of this because the presumption is uh, is is that what 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 is, what is the hallmark of science uh, using such models as physics for example uh, as an exa as, a, as a benchmark the hallmark of science is to be able to present it rigorous quantitative form and that rigorous quantitative form uh, of, of mathematical precision requires us to reduce all the elements and aspects of economic phenomena to a reduced skeletal uh, f uh, 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 ex uh, expression of it uh, of, of, of quantitative variables and quantitative relationships. So uh, imagine that you wanted to say, well, what is, what is a human being? And you say, well, the essence of, of every human being is that they have a skeleton. And we can express this as skeleton in sort of mathematical forms. And now all you think of as human beings is as, as this reduced form skeleton. Uh, well, what happens to flesh and nervous system and skin and the blood flowing and, and, the, and the electrical currents of your brain if all you've done is reduce man to this elemental skeletal representation? They basically drain human, <laughs> the essence of human intentionality, purpose, action to this reduced form of, of of just a quantitative set of relationships expressed in, in mathematical notation. And therefore, th this becomes the model for this and has continued up until this day. Even when they try to deal with things like expectations. Now, expectations involves a mental image of what you think the future may be like based upon your experiences of the past. Now, any one of us who thinks about an experience of the past will have an image of friends, family, an incident, that is real per people who have acted in real ways with their intentions, their unintended consequences, their, their emotions, their, their, their hopes, their dreams, and so on. Uh, and, and how do you project into the future unless you have projections of, of imageries of, of yourself and others whom you might interact with in ways uh, looking to events that have not yet uh, have come. But, 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 but in this mathematical approach, everything is reduced to quantitative statistical probability. The human mind is emasculated, bo both in what it is and, and, and how it would seem in guiding human activity in relationships, including market interactions. And, and that's the dilemma of this. It, 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 it dehumanizes 
what the human being is. And I'm not trying to talk like a squishy, uh, you know, softy sociologist or anthropologist, you know, economists that look down upon these people. I'm talking about devising an economics that enables you to understand man, the logic of his actions, and, ha and the processes through which he interacts with others in market uh, settings, which captures the essence of how human beings actually act, and without which you cannot understand how the real world of social interaction actually occurs. And they just emasculate and take that away. Well, then that, that's an interesting transition then into the Austrian school. That when I when I first discovered Austrian economics in the 80s, now I guess mm -hmm. in the late 70s, um, it was about, I don't know, seven or eight years after I'd graduated from college, I was just stunned because I'm reading Mises, I'm reading Hayek, and I'm saying, where are the charts and graphs? Well, this is economics. Where are the marginal utility curves and so forth? Instead, they were talking about real life that human beings are interacting with one another and yes. they would explain how prices came into existence by virtue of the fact that two people are entering into trades and then you multiply right. those people uh, by thousands and tens of thousands of millions and you see the price system coming into existence right. and so they're explaining life in its real form and so why don't you take it from there and uh, develop this alternative school of thought the Austrian school of thought that was developing it at the same time and really in contravention to the uh, to the perfect competition model, even though Menger may not have recognized that at the time. Right. Let me just add as a, as a footnote in terms of uh, people in the profession itself. Uh, there was a very well-known applied economist, named, a British economist named Phelps Brown. Um, he, when he finally retired in the 1970s, uh, he gave a presidential address before the Royal Economic Society. And uh, looking back on his career as an economist, he was not an Austrian economist, okay? Uh, he, he explained that over many, many years of teaching, his former students, graduate students, would come back to see him. And he had been teaching them in all these mathematical models and, 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 and rigorous quantitative methods of application of economics. And he said in his, 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 his presidential farewell address, uh, leaving academia, retiring. Uh, he asked his students as they came to see him over the years, what that you learned in your graduate economics courses and, and uh, applied economics courses uh, did you find most useful? And what he says is that it had nothing to do with these rarefied, rigorous mathematical models. It had to do with, with the mindset of the most broad and meaningful economic concepts, cost and benefit, the logic in the general terms, of making decisions at, at the margin, the inescapability of trade-offs between because of scarcity, and knowing how to apply those in human settings to understand operations of a firm, the activities of competition in the market in which they were operating, uh, their, 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 their expectations of, of, of future market conditions. And it had absolutely no uh, relationship to the rarefied mathematical models that they had been rigorously trained in in graduate school because they, in fact, had no relevancy. So that's just an aside that, that in fact, that, that, that this is even uh, seen by many who go through the process, but it's, they find it difficult to imagine a different way of thinking about economics because that's the only economics that, that, that they have been introduced to. Now, <clears throat> to get into... Uh, let me interrupt you a second. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're almost out of time. We only got a couple of minutes, so I'm not really sure it'd be worthwhile to get into the Austrian school. Next time. Yeah, why don't we do that next time? Because there's, uh, we can develop the Austrian school, because I, I think we ought to kind of cover how Mises fits into this. We're, how does he come from Wieser and, and Bomberg? Did they know each other? Did they interact? Were they contemporaries? I think uh, people would be interested in that. And then where Hayek fits into this. Yes. And then uh, maybe develop some of the entrepreneurship theories of Israel Kirzner. Yes. But then there's other concepts we still have to, d to discuss. There's uh, where does Keynesian economics fit into all this? Yes. And then there's Milton Friedman in the Chicago School. How does that yes. fit into all this? Yes. And uh, then there's macroeconomics. How does that compare with microeconomics? Yes. 
Uh, so we got, got a, got another minute or so in case you want to make any closing comments as to what we're doing here. Um, well, I think I think that 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 what's important for for many people to understand, perhaps, or at least I think so as an economist, is that economics is an unbelievably powerful tool of reasoning and analysis. It really is an open sesame to understand how a good part of the world operates in terms of the actions and interactions of human beings. But the tools that you use to do that analysis influences how you see the world and the conclusions you draw. And th th this is the importance of, of whether you, you've taken economics courses or not, but for these, these economic approaches often are applied in economic policy the way we talked about just a little earlier. It's important to have at least a general notion of how economists think and the, and the frameworks they use and to realize that some give a more realistic and enriched understanding of market processes and less and some less so. And the Austrians, in my humble opinion, offer that richer insight and understanding of the real world in which we live. And that is where we should pick up with next time. That's great. I mean, I agree with you. And, and I mean, I, it's really a tragedy at how uh, how many students are exposed to economics through this perfect competition model and model building and are bored to tears with the thing. Uh, right. Can't stand economics. But boy, when I discovered the this Austrian school of thought, it was just everything came alive in economics. It became exciting. Things started to make sense. Uh, so maybe we can inspire other people to share that same love of economics that you and I have. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, that's the show for this week. Thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you.